So, uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome back. Uh, glad you made it to the second lecture. I, I didn't scare you off with lecture one. Uh, so today we'll continue uh, talking about some more segmentation paradigms. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, so last time we covered a lot of different topics, and we are going to cover a lot of different topics again this time. Uh, and but the main idea of this lecture is to cover priors, geometry, and topology, uh, how these constraints are incorporated within deep neural networks for segmentation. Uh, then we'll spend uh, a few minutes on representation learning and self supervised learning, uh, and then we'll jump uh, into transformers and transformers would take around 45 minutes. So we'll try to spend the first 45 minutes on the first two topics. Then there are some other topics like model distribution, uh, which we won't have time to cover, but I just wanted to highlight that these are other niche areas uh, which you can look up as well. Oh, Paul, do you know how to like switch it off? I think there switch are like two up? voices. Uh, oh, it's, so it's wait a second. Wait a second. Am I yeah. unmuted? Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess so. Uh, is it better, like the Zoom audience? I guess we will know. Okay, so let's start uh, with shape, uh, geometry, and topology. Uh, cool. So just to set some definitions straight, uh, these are definitions from Wikipedia. And so geometry uh, deals with anything related to uh, the properties of the space in which a geometric object is embedded. Uh, so we can you can think about geometry as the distance, shape, size, the relative positions of different figures in your embedding space. Topology, on the other hand, uh, deals with how properties of these shapes change when you continuously deform these particular shapes or objects in, in your uh, embedded space. So think of it as when an object is deformed uh, via stretching, twisting, crumbling, or bending, how does the space uh, of that particular object change? So these are quite interrelated, uh, interrelated definitions, just to give you an intuition. Right. So why do we need geometry and topological constraints within segmentation? So in the previous lecture, we saw that uh, we get really nice segmentations with these deep learning methods, right? We get good dice scores, we get nice hot stop distances. But the problem with these segmentations are that even if you get a very high dice score, or if you get a very low uh, low hot stop distance between the ground truth and the predicate segmentation, the problem th with the segmentation is that they might be topologically incorrect. Uh, even though they are geometrically accurate, like prediction of a brain looks like a brain, but uh, it might be topologically incorrect. So to why is it stuck on the first slide for some reason on Zoom? Like, here it's fine. Restart, just stop sharing. Stop. Oh. Share it on the desktop. No. All good. Yeah. So, so as I was saying uh, that you might get good segmentations, but they might be topologically incorrect. So what do I mean by that? So think of this particular uh, diagram uh, on, uh, at the bottom, where you are trying to segment the cortical ribbon in a T1 weighted MRI of a human brain. So as you can see, uh, the green is the white matter surface, uh, the green curve, and the red curve is the PL matter uh, or the PL surface, the outer boundary. So to the naked eye, 
uh, this looks a pretty good segmentation. And if you see the dice score, it's pretty high as well. But if you really zoom in, so if I have a 3D rendering of the white matter surface over here, if you zoom in this particular part over here, you can see that the segmentation looks like a white matter surface, but there are some inconsistency in the segmentation. So in the form of these small holes, which should not be there, or these larger holes, which should not be there, or there might be some disconnected component, a small voxel or a few voxels over here, which might be incorrect as well. Uh, so it is really important that we take care of the actual topology uh, when we are segmenting these structures, because for any downstream tasks, uh, that might be really crucial. So most segmentations that we have seen uh, or occur naturally in the human anatomy are single connected component, right? Uh, so what we want to avoid in these segmentations are we don't want any cavities or holes or any disconnected component. So that's why we, we are trying to study how we can incorporate uh, the anatomical knowledge that we already have about a structure of interest into the deep learning segmentation. Uh, so yeah, by geometry, I uh, in the context of segmentations, I mean that it looks like what we want. So a brain structure looks like a brain structure and topology uh, correction is basically uh, keeping in mind that we don't have disconnected components, cavities or holes, right? So, so the first few slides is to just uh, give all the terminology that we are gonna use. Uh, so in 3D voxels, uh, figure A, you can see that uh, in 3D, a particular black voxel over here, it can be defined, uh, the neighborhood of that particular black voxel can be defined in terms of its connected connectivity with the neighboring voxels. So you can have six connections uh, going left and right, back and forth and up and down. Then you can have 18 connectivity and you can have 26 connectivity depending upon the number of voxels that you're interested in, right? Yeah, if we look at, uh, uh, figure number B. So imagine that this is a segmentation, uh, these particular voxels, right, of a particular structure. Uh, now, now this particular voxel over here, uh, this can be like a, this can be an artifact in segmentation, right? Uh, and these are the kind of artifacts, these small, really uh, spurious voxels that we want to get rid of or we want to close the gap in segmentation. So there are two ways to fix this particular segmentation if this is an incorrect voxel. One is to either we can just remove this voxel uh, like over here, or we can fill up the uh, remaining voxels in, that, in the neighborhood of this particular voxel and get a segmentation like this. So both of these segmentations can be correct depending upon uh, what, what anatomical structure that we are segmenting. So, this is basically called closing the hole and this is like opening the hole or getting rid of any cavities, right? So this is what we are interested in. Uh, so some related concepts, uh, which is fine, like we don't have to uh, really understand the, the math behind it, but just to give you an intuition. Uh, it's just, okay, yeah. Uh, so in, in shapes, especially like non-Euclidean shapes, uh, we define a shape or like properties of shape in terms of the number of holes it have, the number of connected components they have or cavities and so on. So if you see like figure A and figure B, uh, they share the same intrinsic topology. That is they're essentially the same shapes because both of them have one, uh, one hole in it, right? Uh, if you see figure number C, uh, which is a cube, uh, this has a spherical topology. That is, a cube is uh, homeographically or homeomorphically equivalent to a sphere. I'll come to that, what it means. Uh, so basically you can deform this cube and make it into a sphere. So the topology of sphere and cube, it remains the same, right? And yeah. Uh, So there is something called Euler characteristic, which I'll come to in a minute. So some more definitions, which will be useful in the coming slides. So there's a notion of simplices and simplicial complexes. Uh, simplexes is basically any building block to build the entire uh, 3D shape. So over here, you can think of simplexes for our purposes in this lecture uh, as simplex of uh, simplex zero, 
which is a point, a line, simplex one, uh, simplex two is a triangle, and simplex three can be thought of tetrahedrons, right? And you have these basic building blocks and you can build more simplicial complexes or your entire 3D structure in non-Euclidean geometry. Um, right, uh, taking one more step further. So as I said that, uh, what we are interested in is understanding the connected components in the segmentations, understanding where are the holes occurring and what are the cavities in the different uh, segmentations. And we want to rectify these particular units in our segmentations, right? So there is a related concept of Betty numbers. This slide is important for the next discussion, uh, which we'll come to in five minutes. So. Betty number, you can think of it as a simplicial complex, or, or basically it, 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 it helps to distinguish these connected components. So as I said, uh, using these components, you can big, build larger and larger objects. And Betty numbers, uh, you can think of them as some property which would help distinguish different 3D objects, right? So Betty number zero, uh, is basically represents the number of connected components. Uh, Betty number one represents the number of holes that you have. And Betty number two is called, uh, represents cavities in 3D, right? So connected components, holes and cavities are represented by Betty numbers. These are the properties which would be helpful in distinguishing different kinds of segmentations uh, and 3D objects, okay? Uh, as promised, uh, another concept, I know I'm throwing a lot of concepts here, but just get an intuitive understanding, uh, even like the math is way beyond the scope of this class. Uh, so Euler characteristic is another like uh, a property that you can assign to a shape that would help distinguish different 3D shapes and segmentations, right? So basically, uh, Basically, what Euler characteristic is, you have a you have a shape, and the number of vertices uh, minus the number of edges plus number of, of faces uh, is is Euler characteristic. So this is a topological invariant, a number that could help distinguish different three uh, D objects, right? So for example, uh, a cube or or a tetrahedron uh, has an Euler characteristic of two because it has four vertices minus six edges. Uh, yeah, I, I, well, the math doesn't comes out here. So. Yeah, I don't know why it is two. Yeah, I think it's a mistake. Uh, but but the the main idea is that uh, by computing the Euler characteristic, you can uh, distinguish the different uh objects so for example uh i'm still not sure why the two but for the cube that we saw a few slides back the Euler characteristic is two and the sphere also has an Euler characteristic of two so essentially these two objects are similar uh based on their topology right uh, yeah so key takeaway from this slide is uh Euler characteristic is a number which can help distinguish different shapes. Uh, now that I've thrown a lot of concepts here, uh, let me uh, give some examples of how uh, shape priors, which you have already seen uh, in, in the previous lectures in this class, but how shape priors used in uh, classic computer vision and how they, they are then translated into deep learning. So, uh, this is something that you're already familiar with, uh, level set segmentation using geodesive active contours and uh, region-based segmentation where you initially deform a curve and uh, using some properties of the image, you are able to segment the different regions, right? So these are pretty looking, uh, pretty looking uh, segmentations, which are kind of topologically correct segmentations. Uh, now, Now I want to highlight uh, again continuing 
some level set segmentation on the left. If you see, this is basically some seed points evol evolving, like active contours evolving to uh, segment the entire spine. Uh, this spine segmentation or the vertebral segmentation in CT looks pretty nice. But if you zoom in at the boundaries of these, uh, these, these spinal structures or the vertebrae, you can see that over here, especially where I'm pointing, that there are some holes in the, in the structure, right? And we want to fill those holes, even though the dice score here might be 90, but these are definitely inconsistent, right? So that's where a, a notion of a shape prior comes into the picture on the right, where I have some knowledge of the vertebrae from before, and I'm able to use this knowledge to constrain the shape in that particular uh, area of interest to segment that particular anatomy. So by using these shape priors, now you can see for that particular individual vertebrae, not only I'm able to get a geometrically accurate segmentation, but also it's topologically consistent, right? We have gotten rid of holes and cavities. Uh, so, so these ideas were there for a very long time. And then recently uh, these ideas are like uh, thinking about how we can incorporate shape and geometry uh, priors within the deep learning uh, networks. Uh, that's that's quite recent. So I might have to skip. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight some of the uh, the classic topology correction papers, uh, which correct our topology based on some uh, based on level set segmentations. Uh, so now we'll just deep uh, go into deep learning segmentation. Uh, so whatever concepts that I threw at the beginning of the class, uh, they will be important now, specifically uh, petty numbers. So, so take an example of this cell segmentation. Uh, we are basically discussing this paper, uh, quite recent paper in 2019, uh, topology preserving uh, deep image segmentation. Uh, it's based on this concept of persistent homology, which I'll explain in a bit, uh, which comes from abstract algebra. Uh, so the goal over here is, uh, again, to reiterate, you have to segment this particular cell. Uh, this is the ground truth. Uh, this is a segmentation from a baseline method, let's say unit. And you can see in this particular segmentation that even though the segmentation looks nice, there are most of the uh, boundaries are segmented, you'll get a high die score. Uh, but but there are definitely holes and these spurious voxels which need to be get rid of, right? So on the right side, this is an example of after of deep learning based segmentation after incorporating uh, topology and geometry constraints uh, uh, within the network, right? So this is what we typically get if it's not topologically constrained, and this is after applying the constraint, right? So this particular paper uses the idea of Betty numbers. That is, uh, uh, it tries to distinguish the number of connected components in the segmentation between the ground truth and the predicted segmentation. It sees connected components, it sees holes, it sees handles. Uh, handle is like just a handle. Uh, and uh, what it is trying to do is, it wants uh, the network to be able to learn the same number of connected components and holes and handles between the, uh, between the ground truth segmentation and the predicted segmentation, right? So before going into the main mathematical details, here is what, what the structure looks like. Uh, so you have an input image, uh, you pass it through your favorite neural network, let's say unit, and what we get is a likelihood function, right? We get a soft max probability output. And typically what we do is we, take a threshold of it, let's say at 0.5 to get the final uh, predicted segmentation. And then we compare that with the ground truth segmentation and we compute kind of binary cross entropy loss or dice loss, right? But now the idea is not only use dice loss, but also have a, another loss, uh, which takes into account the topology, right? And this loss, uh, the way it is designed in this paper is that you can differentiate it with respect to the input, and so you can train the network end to end, right? So you don't have to do segmentation in one step and then do topology correction, uh, but rather you can just have one network which also does the topology correction, right? So that's where differentiable loss function uh, comes into the picture. So next we'll discuss what is this topology correction and how the 
loss uh, is designed. Right? So again, uh, the key idea is we want to compare the notion of some some notion of topology between ground truth segmentation and predictive segmentation. And we are going to compare uh, Betty numbers, which is the number of connected components, holes, and cavities. So, so uh, look at this, right? Uh, so if you look over here, uh, let's say this figure B, let's start with B. So this is a ground truth of some object, right? Uh, we can see that there are two holes, right? Uh, or there are like just one connect, there's just one connected component in the ground truth. There are two holes and there are two handles, right? Uh, and on A, the figure A is some segmentation that we get from our output of a deep neural network without topology correction, right? So the segmentation that we get over here is uh, we no longer have. Uh, one connected component, we have actually two connected components, and we just have one hole or handle, right? So this is definitely, the, if you compare the dice between these two, you'll get a very high dice, but it's definitely incorrect, right? So we want to uh, make sure that these things are are filled up, right? So again, we, we see that we are talking about connected components, holes, handles, uh, and we want to make sure that those things are equal here, right? Uh, we can skip this for the lecture. Uh, right. So this segmentation, let's say, remember that also I said that we get a likelihood function that is after softmax, we kind of take off threshold at let's say 0.5 probability and whatever is greater than 0.5, we say that's the foreground and everything below that is the background, right? So I chose an alpha value of 0.5, right? And that's what we typically do. Uh, but nothing is stopping us from taking or choosing alphas from, let's say, right from zero all the way to one, or going other way around, right from one all the way to zero, right? We can choose probability uh, at any, uh, using any alpha value. Let me... uh, yeah, we'll come, come back to this. So, okay, so now we understand that we have to choose some alpha to get the output segmentation and every output segmentation has these inconsistency, right? So now let's say that I'm choosing my alpha uh, from one all the way to zero, right? So at different alpha values or different threshold, alpha is the threshold. So at different threshold values, I'll get different kind of segmentations, right? So. These are the different kinds of segmentations that I'll get, right? Does this make sense? So, so the idea is that uh, you go from alpha one to alpha zero, and let's say an increment of 0 0.05 or 0 0.1, and you obtain these different segmentations at different alphas, okay? Now, what we can do is, uh, we can do the same thing. So for the, so this is for the likelihood function that is the predictive segmentation, right? So uh, now is where things will get tricky. So uh, let's say the process of choosing alpha, let's say we, we will say it filtration, okay? So what we can do is we can filter these values from alpha one to alpha zero and get these different segmentations. And at each segmentation, we are getting different number of connected components. So here you see, we get two connected components, right? And alpha at 0.8, we see that uh, we are developing this particular handle, right? Over here. So there was no handle over here, but now we have another handle over here. And now since this handle is closed, now we also have a, um, what do you call it? A hole over here, right? So, and we can, we can keep on doing this for every alpha value, right? For, for the predicted segmentation. So as we are going from alpha one to alpha zero, uh, so certain, certain things or certain objects, like when I say objects from now on, it's connected components and cavities and holes and handles. So these objects are getting 
created and they're getting destroyed, right? So here, as I said, uh, there was, uh, let's go from left to right. So there are like two connected components. Then there is a uh, birth of this longer handle, right? Uh, and there is also the birth of this uh, hole. Now, if we go to alpha 0.5, uh, yeah, uh, then keep on going from alpha 0.5, then go to alpha 0.47. We see that this another handle is created, right? So now we have two holes, right? But we still have two connected components. We have two handles and we have two holes. Now at 0.4 alpha, uh, the now there is a depth of the connected component mm -hmm. and now we just have one connected component, right? So things are like, there is a birth of these objects and then there are deaths of these objects. So birth of connected components, holes, and death of these connected components and holes as we are going from alpha point one, uh, alpha one to alpha zero, right? Does this make sense so far? I guess, yeah. So, okay, so, so the blue lines and red lines, uh, again, this is important. Uh, blue lines or the bl blue bars are basically telling you the connected components and the red bars are telling you uh, the handles or the holes, right? So uh, like over here, uh, we start off with two connected components here and one, it, there is like one connected component for sure, which is going from alpha one to alpha zero, right? But the second connected component dies at 0.4, right? Because now we just get one connected component here. So this is basically what these blue bars and red bars are telling you. And then same for these handles. So there were like two handles and now there are like no handles. Right? So stuff like that. So this is what these red and blue bars are telling you that what things are dying and what things are uh, like, uh, what new things are getting birth. Uh, so, so you can keep track by these blue and red objects, uh, these blue and red bars, the different objects. Right? So this is for the likelihood function that the network is predicting, right? And the same thing can be done from the, for the ground truth segmentation as well, right? But we are not taking the ground truth from uh, like all stages. Ground truth is already fixed, so we can only see it at alpha one and alpha zero. So there are always there is always one connected component, and there are two handles or holes in the ground truth over here, right? So now, uh, can we compare uh, the number of connected holes uh, and comp connect uh, connected components and holes in the ground truth, which are fixed? To the to the connected components and holes uh, in the likelihood function, which are all these values, right? So if there is a way to compute a loss function between these two things, we can say that hey, uh, we are trying to force the network to have the same number of these uh, these complexes uh, as the ground truth segmentation, right? So instead of directly comparing these Betty numbers or these number of holes or number of uh, these number of holes or these number of cavities in terms of a of a number, what you can do is you can like make these graphs uh, or plots where uh, the these are called persistent diagrams. So let's just see the example for this one. Uh, this is for the ground truth. So on the x-axis, the death time, on the y-axis, the birth time for all these components over here, right? So, uh, so like this dude is plotted over here, these things are plotted over here, right? So the bars are telling you the birth and the death time as you already discussed. So I'm just plotting those things in a graph. Uh, so it will tell you that uh, it takes birth, this blue object takes birth at, uh, at one and it never dies, right? 
And the same thing can be done for these four objects over here as well, right? Uh, so this goes here, this one here, and these two are like here. So again, x-axis tells you the uh, y-axis tells you the birth time, and x-axis tells you the death time of these objects, right? So, so now what we do is we just compute a, a loss function between between these two coordinates or these two functions, right? So we can compute a loss between this guy and this guy. Okay. And what we are doing is we are trying to make the graphs of these two things similar. So we are forcing the graph to of the predictive segmentation to look like that of the ground truth. I know it's very confusing, <laughs> but but the, but the idea is like, uh, do you get a high level sense of what we are doing? instead of like going into math, math and exactly how these uh, loss functions are computed. Just, just what at the basic level we are computing, we are trying to compare the components uh, in the ground truth and the predicted uh, segmentation set. Right? We are trying to compare some characteristics of the topology because these are the things which define the topology of the, of the, of the 3D segmentation. And that's what we are just comparing. It's okay to not get the full gist of it, uh, just the high level idea of what it's it's doing. Any questions so far? How do I remove it now? Right, so, so as I said, this is a differentiable loss function where you are just, uh, so this is the birth and the death of the, of the predictions and of the ground truth. And you're just taking a mean square error term between the birth and the death times of these uh, topological objects between predictions and ground truth. So to give you some examples, so these are RGB images on the, in the first column, the ground truth segmentations. Uh, these the next three uh, columns are basically <laughs> uh, segmentations by different uh, networks, uh, different segmentation networks, and the last one is the proposed algorithm. So over here you can see that uh, for this retina segmentation, uh, it has this particular ground truth, and if you compare, uh, let's say this is the unit and this one is the current paper. So even though unit will give a nice dice, but it misses out a lot of thin structures and uh, and it has a lot of disconnected components, a lot of different holes, which the topology corrected segmentation takes care of, right? Uh, so I thought of presenting this in another paper, but I think I think paper number one already gave you a lot of information, and this will create havoc. So <laughs> I'm gonna skip this paper. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight that you can specifically design loss functions uh, incorporating topology for particular anatomy of interest that you are interested in. So this particular paper, uh, another uh, another nice paper on on having differentiable loss functions uh, for topology correction called centerline dice. Uh, so they specifically design a loss function to segment tubular structures such as the retinal vessels or this vasculature structure in the brain, right? And the major advantage that they take off or the key concept that they are trying to uh, exploit is skeletons, which you might have seen in previous lectures. Uh, skeleton of the foreground uh, of the ground truth and of the predator segmentation. So if the skeletons which define uh, a lot of topology 
of two different structures, if you can bring them close together, if, the, if you can match the skeletons, uh, uh, you can say that they have a they have same topology. So that is what uh, this particular paper tries to do. Uh, yeah, so skeleton is something like this. If you have this particular vessel or think of this as blood vessels, uh, this is how a blood, typical blood vessel looks like. And this is a typical skeleton of that particular blood vessel. And if you can match these two skeletons, if you can match the skeletons between the prediction and the ground truth, then you can guarantee some topology correction in the segmentations. Uh, it's a very simple, simple idea based on erosion and dilation uh, within deep learning or within deep learning networks using deep learning tools such as MaxPool and MinPool. Uh, yeah. So I think it's a good idea to skip it. Uh, but to show some quality results, um, again, if you see, let's say, over here, uh, this particular Google Maps uh, diagram uh, where you have a satellite image on the left. These are the labels of the road network. These are the segmentations. So these are the ground truth. Uh, this is the segmentation obtained by just using a simple dice loss. Uh, again, uh, you see inconsistency in terms of connected components, holes, and which this paper kind of takes care of. Again, different cell structures, uh, retinal, uh, vasculature, and uh, other vasculature structures, tube-like structures. Uh, so, so they are. So, those particular papers was to give you an idea of how you can explicitly design loss functions so that uh, you incorporate topological constraints. A uh, lot of heavy math goes into the picture, again, out of scope of this talk. Um, so now I'll just shift some gears and tell you uh, about some brain segmentation problems. So in the last lecture, we saw both in vivo and ex vivo brain segmentations. Those segmentations look nice, but they had some problems. So just to set the stage, uh, this is, let's say, a segmentation of the cortical, uh, the, the cortical ribbon uh, in a T1 weighted MRI uh, of the human brain. You have this inner surface, you have this white matter in white, then you have this inner surface, call, let's call it the white matter surface. Uh, then you have CSF uh, on the out, outside, and this is the gray matter. And then you have another boundary in green called the PL surface. So in the next, Five minutes. I'm going to tell you how we can apply, uh, we can build networks uh, in a way that takes care of this uh, topological constraints. So, so if you see over here, like, so this is one inconsistency. So, these two sulci, uh, it's like a bridge sulcus. So, right. Uh, so, if you just use any segmentation algorithm like a unit, uh, it will give you like this particular boundary, as you can see over here. But what we want is we want to separate out this particular bridge sulcus. We want a boundary over there so that we know that it's like part of different, it's going like this. So there should be kind of boundary over here. Or, or to give you example, this is again an incorrect segmentation. Uh, this should be background, the small region uh, should be actually CSF but it is incorrectly labeled as gray matter. And again, we can incorporate priors, uh, which would help resolve these small issues. So, so the task over here in this particular paper is, uh, again, the next set of papers is just to give you an idea of what the field is about, not to go into depth, uh, is like we start with an initial white matter surface uh, in 3D. Uh, and what we want, so we we start with this particular surface in 3D in red, and we want to inflate it and actually get the get the whole brain segmentation of the PL surface. So if you can see the difference, so this is the white matter surface, and this is the input, and we want the output to look like this, right? 
So this particular paper, what it does is it takes an initial white matter surface along with the actual input MRI, uh, compute features from these two together, and in a series of deformations, then it gives the final output surface as this. The main uh, takeaway from this paper is that everything is done in 3D and using both MRI space, that is voxel, voxel coordinates and also 3D geometric coordinates. So it involves graph convolution networks and also Euclidean uh, space uh, networks, which we are, uh, which we have seen a lot, right? So the main, again, uh, the other thing is that uh, the reason behind it gives you a nice topological surface uh, without any any inconsistency is that uh, you start with a nice surface, and the hypothesis in this paper is that you will, if you start with a topologically consistent surface, uh, they want to also produce a topologically constrained, uh, consistent segmentation, right? Um, so these are some examples from the paper uh, where these are, let's say, I'll just compare the first two ones. So this is a rendering of the PL surface using free surfer, uh, where if you zoom in, you will see that there are some inconsistency in segmentations and PL and then uh, improves on top of it, right? The thing is with free surfer is that they have the segmentation and then they also have topology correction. Uh, it works great, I guess. But with PLNN, what they are trying to do is do everything end to end. So they don't have two steps, segmentation and topology correction, but they're just actually making it into one step. Right. Uh, another example of what you can do is uh, you can start with a, again, the here, here the goal is to predict actually not the PL surface, but to predict the white matter surface. Uh, so what they do is, again, take an input image, uh, pass it through some CNN, extract some features, and then have a template mesh, which have the same topology as what you want in your predicted mesh. So this particular mesh and this particular mesh has the same topology. So what they are saying is that, hey, if I have a topologically constrained, consistent uh, input, I will also get a consistent uh, output. So yeah. Uh, just one line summary is that you can combine features from MRI and 3D meshes and get uh, nice predicted segmentations. Uh, yeah, so here are, is, a, is a good example of what this particular paper does. Uh, so free surfer, the topologically corrected segmentations from free surfer, uh, it is shown in yellow. Uh, and then from the topo fit is shown in blue, and uh, they say that it takes better care of uh, these minor inconsistency. Where uh, in free server this is incorrectly segmented, and then in topo fit it's currently segmented. So yeah, and another example over here where free surfer, uh kind of segments it more into the deep region, uh, which is incorrect, I guess. And then top of it uh, has a better segmentation. Another paper, uh, we can skip this, but if you get time, uh, do read this. Any questions so far? So we, I know we covered a lot in geometry topology. Uh, it's, but this was to give you an idea of how the field has structured and what kind of papers are there and what you can do with them. Uh, so the next five minutes, we're gonna spend on representation learning and self-supervised learning. Uh, this is another paradigm in deep learning, uh, which basically I would say in the last couple of years have, been the main uh, like a driving force to get state of the art uh, results in almost any deep learning uh, task. So what do we mean by representation learning or self-supervised learning? So you, you might have already seen in the previous deep learning lectures that, uh, so by now you know that uh, a, a neural network is a function approximator, right? 
you have an input and you have an output and you design a function which will map your input to your output. Uh, the claim with deep learning methods is that they are universal function approximators, so they can approximate any function that you throw at them, right? But to approximate these functions from input to output, uh, you want to learn representations which are really good so that you're able to map your input to your output, right? So entire field of representation learning is basically uh, coming up with nice ways to learn good weights in your deep learning network. So, uh, yeah. And a closely related topic to that is self-supervised learning. Uh, so the way you, you learn good representations is uh, using uh, something called self-supervision. Another note is that you might have heard of transfer learning or fine tuning where you take a network for one particular task and then suppose you have a new task at hand, you take the same network, use the pre-trained weights that you have from network number one, uh, just do a little bit of fine tuning on some of the layers and you get better performance, right? So that's another way where representation learning is helpful. So I can have a network uh, which I which I wanted a good representation for. So uh, I'll design some loss functions which help me learn good weights, and those weights can be used for another task. Right. So so suppose you have a segmentation task. Uh, let's say that's your down your downstream task is segmentation, uh, but you have very limited labels with you. Uh, so example brain segmentation. Uh, you, you have a new modality, uh, which you have never seen before, and you have very few training data for that. Let's say you have only five subjects. Uh, so what you would do essentially is uh, you would design a network uh, and train the network with related content. Uh, so you all, let's say you also have a lot of uh, brain images from some other data sets. So you will take those other data sets. Uh, and you will train a network using those particular data sets to learn a good representation or to learn some good weights. And these weights can then be used for your actual uh, segmentation task on your new modality, right? So how do we learn those weights and get a good representation? So pretty simple, uh, this particular paper. So what we do is, uh, what, we are, what we are like interested is learning weights that would provide nice context for some other task at hand, right? So the way that you can do is uh, you have your, let's say, let's just start with this. You have your network. So this is G eng is basically an encoder. Uh, this is some loss function, right? So what you can do is uh, you can give your network some input uh, and some rotated copies of that input as well. And your, your task, is to learn uh, how much that particular patch or that particular input is rotated uh, with respect to your original image, right? So, so you can do this trivial task of rotation prediction of your input image, and you can train your network and use those weights for some of the task of, let's say, segmentation uh, for your task two. Uh, another way to learn good representations is to jumble up your input uh, in like a jigsaw puzzle. And then what we are interested in is to reconstruct the actual input, right? So once you complete this task on your large data set, you can use those particular trained network and then fine tune with your new data set to learn uh, the task at hand. Another thing is that you can do is you can divide your images into different patches and you can uh, kind of predict uh, what what is the next representation? What is the representation of the next patch given the previous patch? So it, it's kind of predicting next word given previous word, something like that. So these tasks, like these, are very simple tasks, uh, and they help learn good representations. Yeah. So rotation I already talked about, and then you can also have uh, different networks. Uh, this I'll skip. I think. Paul will come back to this in his next lecture when he talks about contrastive learning. Uh, yeah, so essential idea of representation is learning is to learn nice weights that can be used to fine tune your other networks uh, for your secondary task or your main task.
Any questions so far? I think I'm giving more information than last time. <laughs> Any, like, should I clear anything uh, before moving on to transformers? Things are gonna like jump up now. Uh, so yeah, uh, transformers. Uh, so you already pretty much familiar with uh, the the media, and you have already seen this that these are the new models, large scale models, GPT three, DALI two, which are used in image generation, text to speech generation, text to image generation. And all these models uh, are like very computationally expensive and very large models. And the common thing between them is that they are based on a class of networks called transformers. And transformers is arguably the current state of the art and the, the hot thing in deep learning these days. So, so the previous things that we talked about representation learning, uh, transformers inherent architecture is again the same, that you want to learn good representations by maximally uh, getting all the features that you can do, you can extract from your input uh, images or text, right? So key idea over here is to learn good features so that you can have a downstream task or have tasks that you are currently doing. So for the next 35 minutes, uh, I'm again going to throw a lot of information. We will digress a bit and learn a bit about RNN in one slide. Uh, we'll learn about language modeling in particular. So uh, nothing related to the images. Then we will we looked at attention in the last class. So we'll look at attention in RNNs. We we'll look then we we'll look at transformers and we will see what is attention in transformers. Then we we'll look at how going from text now we can apply transformers to vision applications like medical images and natural images. Uh, we won't have time for code, but then I'll just throw some papers out there in two minutes to tell you what is going on in medical imaging. Right. So. So in the previous class, we looked at attention mechanisms. So what attention is basically doing is that, so okay, even before that, in image analysis, by now you know that uh, whatever you're trying to learn from the images comes from the image itself, right? So you're trying to analyze different patterns between different parts of the images, right? Uh, be it correlation, be it convolutions. So you're trying to get information from different parts of the images and then do a prediction task, right? So context is really important when uh, you're doing image analysis. So context between different parts of the images, right? And that is what we looked at attention, uh, context between uh, information coming from previous layers, uh, from the downstream uh, or the downsampling uh, part of the unit and from the upsampling part of the unit, right? So you're kind of looking at context from wherever you can get from the images and the network, right? So that is what attention was, uh, attending to different parts of the of the of your input, be it, be it text sentences or be it images. So, so the way that I've structured this is in like like the way that I just told you, and it will be much more clear clearer uh, if we start with RNNs and then see how attention was introduced in RNNs and then how attention was introduced in uh, transformers and then take it to images. So I don't think so we have seen this in the in the class, but recurrent neural networks, uh, you might have seen them in other classes for sure. Uh, it's basically, uh, it's just like convolution. It's another type of neural network architecture or paradigm where you, it's basically used for, mostly used for text applications. Uh, so here is an example of, let's say you have an input and an output and you're trying to translate uh, this particular sentence, I'm a student from French to English and you use an 
recurrent neural network for that, right? Uh, so, so recurrent neural networks are sequence to sequence. What I mean by them is, so right now, I'm just representing RNN as a black box. I'll decompose that later, or uh, unbox it later. Uh, so recurrent neural networks, what they do is they take one input at a time, and then they give one output at a time, right? So it's sequence by sequence. So this is what we are seeing. We see one, one word entering at a time, and we are getting one output at a time, right? Cool. Uh, Next, uh, so behind the hood, what is happening is this particular RNN is again, what we have seen numerous times. It's encoder, we have latent features, and then we have decoder, right? This is one slide summary of what RNN is. So this is a basic building block of an RNN uh, where you have the current input X. So let's say uh, this is some word X. Uh, you have some context vector V, which is basically information coming from a previous time step, right? Because RNNs are like sequential, so you can think of them as going in time or like different time steps. So this is the current input that I have is called, let's say X or U. Uh, context or information coming from the previous time step that is summarized in this vector V. Uh, using these two uh, information, that is the current information, the previous information, you can get new information for that particular uh, time step or state uh, called H, which is a hidden vector. Uh, and then you can finally get this output O for that particular time step, right? So if I just, un if I'll just unfold this or unroll it and actually show you this in time. So let's consider this middle thing. So, at a time step t, you have this input x. So this might be a word in that sentence, uh, uh, like somewhere I'm translating my sentence and this might be some middle word, right? Uh, so this is that particular input word x. You're getting all your information from the previous time step summarized in this vector v. Uh, you take these two things together, you get a hidden state h and then you can get an output from all this information uh, for that particular time step, right? So if it's a sentence, uh, I am a student, so all the information coming from, if, if xt is the word, uh, I am a, so if xt is the word a uh, in that sentence, I am a, right? Mm -hmm. So all the information from I am is coming from these two are from the left. Uh, information from A is coming over here. Uh, information from IM is coming here. And then you will have the output over here, whatever that translation output is into the another language, right? And then you can keep on doing that uh, for all the time steps. So the key takeaway is that in a particular RNN unit, uh, you have information at that particular time step, previous input, and you get new information. And you can pass that information to the next time step again as V. It's important to understand this slide, like the intuition, because the next slides, everything will develop uh, based on this slide. Uh, just to give you an idea that this is how an internal unit looks like. Uh, LSTM blocks and GRUs, these are different building blocks. Uh, so whatever you see in this H is basically something, a bunch of different convolutions, activations, non-linearities happening inside that, right? So this is how it, it looks like. This is a block at a particular time step. This is everything previously, and this is what is going to happen in the next. Right, uh, again, to summarize uh, that slide, but in this particular notation, uh, for agreement time step, you have input, you have hidden state or the information coming from previous time steps, you have output, and then you pass on whatever you learn over here to the next hidden state, right? So hidden state is nothing but that context that is coming from previous time steps, right? Uh, 
So again, uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, input, encoder, decoder within that RNN and output. Uh, so suppose I'm at time step two, uh, my current input X is, uh, however you pronounce this student in French, uh, whatever information is coming from JSU or JSU, I don't know. <laughs> uh, if that is coming from this hidden state uh, and then using this input X and your hidden state, you can get your output, uh, well, you can get another hidden state and then you can get output uh, in English. Okay. Now, what was happening so far was in this, now, now let's explore what is happening over here in this encoder decoder architecture of, of the RNN block that we have. There's a pun here if you have. Uh, so, these are the couple of papers which introduce attention mechanism within RNN uh, for sentence to sentence translation. And we are gonna look uh, intuitively what these papers are doing. So, so, so far, uh, like, let's do this. Yeah. So in this slide, what I was saying, uh, so there is an encoder which encodes everything coming from French. And then there is another RNN which decodes everything and makes it into English, right? So at the intersection of this encoder decoder, uh, mm -hmm. we are just passing on this final hidden state, right? We are just passing one hidden state which captures everything that is coming from French sentence, right? Uh, so what it does is it is taking all that information but only in one hidden state that is coming from the last time step uh, before this decoder. But now what if we are not only interested in what is coming from just the previous time step, but we want information from all the previous time steps. So I want information from, I am a student in French, uh, and I want, uh, yeah, so I want information from everything that I've seen so far uh, explicitly, not only, like, not only incorporated in just this hidden state, but actually get all the hidden states from the previous time steps. So that way, if I, so remember this here, I'm getting information only from the latest time step. But now if I pay attention, what I want is information from all the previous hidden states, right? So something like this. So this is what I want to pass to my decoder. Right? So what is happening over here is that I'm attending to everything uh, in my sentence, right? Think of it in an image where I'm not only looking at my neighboring voxels, for saying if I'm a voxel, I want to segment myself. I'm not even looking at like my immediate neighbors, but I want to see patches which are different, uh, like which are far away in the image. Well. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great time to think of a question. <laughs> well, you guys were so good last time. 13 questions. Yes, I do. This is. I think I'm scaring off everyone with all this content. <laughs> no, you're not. He's not scaring you guys off, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. This is great. This is like state of the art. I'm out of fear. Google is going to be heating up the rest of it. Actually, Hulk is, is doing an entrance. Oh. Uh, uh, there was a question. We have 20 minutes. Uh, 
A lot of results of segmentation is going to Yeah, so inherently, the convolutions that we do, they detect edges as well in low level features, right? So uh, one of the first, the, 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 the features that you learn in a CNN or an RNN, those are essentially feature uh, edges and contours that you learn in the early on stages. And then on the later stages or the later part of the network is when the classification head helps in classification. Uh, and yes, uh, it's possible to use edge detection as a shape prior. Uh, there are papers which do that explicitly, uh, not mentioned here. For RNN, is there a way that the output changes the order? For some languages, the order of the words might be different. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know much about RNNs, but they do take into account all of this. And when we see transformers, this would make uh, sense how they take care of order. Uh, is it the same context vector V that is being used in each of the time steps of RNN? No, so the context vector V or the hidden state H, uh, they they change, right? Uh, you take uh, you take the immediate, so far what we have seen is that they take the immediate context from the previous time step. So it changes at every time step. Cool, uh, so attention in RNNs. So, so far uh, what I was saying that one particular time steps uh, or like the deco, I lost my kind of course. Uh, yeah, so, so far we have seen that the decoding stage takes the immediate hidden state. So what, what if we take all the hidden states so far we have seen in the encoding stage so that we can extract knowledge explicitly and attend to long range connections rather than just immediate connections. Uh, and then I gave you an example of how we can think of it in images as well. So yeah. Uh, so the way that you can do attention is, uh, again, we'll go very fast from now, but I think uh, intuition, I should give you the intuition. So these are the three hidden states from n number of, let's say the three time steps, we get three hidden states. Uh, then we can just multiply them with some scoring mechanism, again, done in, in the network itself. And then once we have a scoring mechanism, this is basically telling you how much weight to give each context vector or how much weight to give to each particular section in that particular sentence, right? So if I'm somewhere in the middle of the sentence, right, I want to give attention to what is immediate to me. The mo I'll give most attention to what is uh, immediate to me and I'll give less attention to what is uh, what was before that word, right? But I want to give attention to all the all the words in the sentence. So you can uh, have attention squaring mechanisms for uh, for the different hidden vectors and get this context vector. Uh, <sighs> so again, uh, this was the encoding stage. I'm getting all my hidden vectors from the encoding stage, and I'll pass all my hidden vectors to the decoding stage. And the decoding stage is where this attention thing is gonna happen. So whatever you see in this slide is basically happening at every time step, right? So at every time step, we have uh, we have the current input, we have some initialization, uh, we do this attention mechanism uh, to attend to different uh, parts of the sentence, and then we concatenate them, do some processing and output the word at that particular time step. Whatever information is over here, we pass on to the next time step. We pass on, again, the three hidden states here as well, give some different weighting of attention, and then pass it on, right? So this is a perfect diagram to understand. Uh, so how French is being translated into English. So let's say the word am, it is attending to, uh, or like it's better to see a, a student is attending to the previous time steps uh, and it is giving the shades are telling you how much attention it is giving to the different words. 
So finally, uh, we come to the main paper of transformers. Uh, our attention is all you need. Uh, I guess who doesn't like attention? Uh, so, so with attention. So now, so transformer is basically think of it like a building block. Just where, just as we saw with ResNet, uh, just as we have a ResNet module, we can have a transformer module. Uh, and transformer is this beefy architecture, which I'll uh, explain in the coming slides. What it is doing is at every layer, you can step, uh, you can stack these transformer blocks uh, to get attention uh, from different parts of your uh, input. Uh, so these are different blocks that we are gonna uh, stack up and then get our output. Uh, so some notation here. Uh, so attention is basically a function which takes in three different values, uh, a query, a key, and a value. Uh, what we are basically doing is uh, we are taking the dot product between Q and K, uh, normalize it with some, some factor, uh, and then this dot product is being multiplied by the value. I'll tell you what these things stand for. But what essentially we are doing is taking dot products and then weighting them by some value. Again, uh, recall from the last lecture that dot product essentially me measures the similarity of different objects, right? Different vectors. So here you can think of K, uh, Q, and B as different parts of your sentences uh, or different uh, patches in an image. So what we are doing is measuring similarities between different words and measuring similarity between different patches in an image. So this is a notation of what I just told you. We have Q, K, V, query, key, and value. Uh, we compute a dot product between these two and then weight them by a value, right? So this is a building block. So we'll build up everything and get to the final transform architecture. So this is the main building thing, just like a ResNet. Uh, the resident module, this is an attention module where uh, Q and K and B, again, uh, I'm stressing this point, uh, this can be a representation of one particular word, this is a representation of another word, and this is a representation of a third word, and you're computing similarities between these three words together. Right? So again, uh, now we are doing, so we, we saw that we did sentence translation uh, from French to English using RNNs. Now we can do the same thing by using transformers. Okay. Again, uh, transformers, uh, the building block that I showed you uh, in this slide, uh, this particular is a building block of attention mechanism. You can stack them up in encoder decoders uh, to get the final architecture. So again, uh, you have a bunch of encoder layers, you have a bunch of decoder layers, and you get final output. Within each encoder, or what is there in this encoder block, uh, it is basically something related to self-attention and a simple feed-forward network. Taking this further, uh, so, so this is what I was telling you, right? Uh, we feed in, three different words to this input over here. The first input, uh, we pass it through this one block of encoder. And in that particular block of encoder, we have a self-attention mechanism, which basically uh, computes uh, similarities between these three words, right? And it passes on the representation uh, to the next layer after going through a feed-forward network. Just just understand it like with intuition. Don't go into how things are done uh, because we don't have much time. So, so this is this is what I just tell, told you that we have let's say two input words, uh, and we want to compute some notion of similarity between these two words that can be done via self-attention. Once we have a notion of similarity, 
we'll get some representation z1 z2 which can pass through a feed forward network and then go on to the next layer right so just last slide before i go into applications uh the those two input words between which we want to get similarities uh they can be represented let's say by some vector x1 x2 uh associated with that we have some other kinds of representation so with this particular word we have this representation x1 we also have a representation of this particular word uh q k and b that is queries keys and b's so these are different representations for this particular word right and for another word we will have similar things we will have representations x2 q2 k2 and v2 so basic idea of this particular slide is for every word you can have these four sets of uh, representations right now we can do some kind of dot products between these representations to get another representation which tells you how similar these two words are right so if we are for this particular word, if I'm computing the attention with respect to this, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, as I told you, uh, we take the dot product between Q1 and K1, so that is self attention, uh, and Q1 and K2 over here, and then weight them by the values, uh, V1 and V2, add them up, and you get a representation Z1. So for every word in our input, you get a representation which tells you how much other words are influencing that particular word. Okay. I think we might have to skip a lot. Uh, yeah, sorry, there's a lot. Uh, So, so this, is, this is what we saw so far. We have input words, we go through encoder, uh, we get uh, some kind of self-attention representation. Then we keep on stacking them uh, like encoder layers after layers and decoder layers after layers. And we can get our final classification loss at the end. Right? I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, I just want to give you, uh, so I, I hope that you understand that the main intuition behind what Transform is doing, it's a bunch of building blocks where it is just trying to compare different parts of images and different parts of text and trying to get as much information as possible from that particular images, right? So for images, what you do is, uh, so as I, was, as I was saying, right, if this is a classification task, of this particular uh, what what this particular image is, you can divide that into patches. Uh, think of it; the, these as the words that we have been looking at. So, suppose I want to get a representation of this particular patch. Then, what I will be doing in transform transformers is that I'm looking at I'm looking at. So, if I want representation for this, I'm not only looking at representations of the nearby patches, but I'm looking at representations of all the other patches as well and attending to those patches right so transformers are like state of the art uh, they require very heavy computation uh, the main advantage of transformers only come through pre training that is you need a lot of data uh, to get the maximum benefit out of transformers and if you have a lot of data then you'll probably uh, get uh, state of the art results in your in most of your tasks uh, I'll, I'll just close i'll just take some questions and then does there have to be a one-to-one -one number of encoders rns to attention uh it depends upon the task for this particular question there can be different encoders and decoders how do you know how long the output sequence would be example yeah so this is like you you, you have some you have the training data and you define some uh, rules as well of how to take care of these things uh, 
So you have to put some of your intuition and heuristics to design such networks. Then how does RNN translate French to English in a comprehensible way if not all words are in French translation? Yeah, uh, again, it comes from training data and natural language processing uh, of like semantic parsing of the different words and uh, nouns, adverbs, adjectives of between different languages. Uh, in five minutes, I'll just tell you what can be done with uh, transformers and uh, uh, in, in image biomedical image analysis. Uh, so again, uh, if you want to segment this particular image into different uh, segmentation into different anatomies, what you can do is you can pass this entire image in in, in patches, uh, pass it through the transformer blocks that we just saw and then you can get your output. So again, another network for image segmentation. So most networks in transformers for image segmentation and medical imaging, they again look like a unit. Uh, but remember in last class, what we discussed was how unit evolved during the years and we were adding different components to it. Uh, this is the same way. It is again a unit, but here, all the components of the unit are being replaced by these transformer blocks. Right? So in the encoder, you can have uh, representations using transformer blocks. And over here, you can have your vanilla CNNs. And you again have the same skip connections going here. Uh, you can again use transformers for pre-training uh, or representation learning using self-supervised losses. Uh, then you can use, so this is, an informer, uh, last time we talked about any unit, it's similar to any unit, but everything is replaced by transformer blocks. Then you can do image registration, both affine and deformable uh, registration by replacing uh, the stuff that you have seen like voxel morph. Uh, and instead of that, you can replace all the blocks with transformer uh, self-attention blocks. I know this is a 